a great pleasure to be here. And thank you so much uh, to the NSE. And I am very honored to be the RH Patil lecturer this year. The NSE has done an amazing job, as we just heard. And uh, I, uh, I thank uh, Mr. Dr. Lime for the very nice introduction and, and discussion. I'd like to talk about um, geopolitical risk tonight. And we are in a time when geopolitical risk is on everybody's mind. And as we uh, study and plan our investment portfolios and look at, at our performance, it's very common to say, well, I would have done better if it hadn't been for geopolitical risk. So can we talk more precisely about what we mean by geopolitical risk? And this slide kind of suggests one view of what we mean by geopolitical risk. It's, it's, a, it's a picture of a sculpture in a garden in Budapest, which is dedicated to Soviet-era art. And it really captures that idea. And is this really what we mean by geopolitical risk? Well, let's take a look. Uh, I'm going to talk about a paper tonight, which is joint with uh, Susanna Martins, and discusses a way of measuring geopolitical risk and then examining how it impacts financial market stability. So what actually do we mean by geopolitical risk? Is this about politics or is it about economics? Is it about terrorism, military risks, cyber risks? Or is it about more conventional changes like elections and congressional actions and political movements? Is it about the level of risk or is it about the surprise? And is it best measured in the news or in the financial markets themselves. This leads to a lot of different ways to measure geopolitical risk as you answer these questions. A couple of quotes might lead the way to what I'm going to do tonight. We are drowning in information and starving for knowledge. Not too bad. And then from the work of the statisticians that have brought us a lot of the big data and artificial intelligence research comes the answer. The statistician's job is to make sense of it all, to extract important patterns and trends, and understand what the data says. We call this learning from the data. We are going to try to learn from the data what geopolitical risk really is. We have a website at the Volatility and Risk Institute at NYU, which produces measures of risk all over the world every day. And when you go to our website, the first thing you'll see is a volatility map. And what this is is a map of the world color-coded for volatility. And this is the, what it looked like on, I guess, Saturday, which was the forecast of what Monday was going to look like. And the idea is that in countries where volatility is low, they're color-coded as green. And when volatility is high, they're color-coded as red. And then there's gradations in between. So the surprising thing you see from looking at this map is, of course, how much green there is. We often think volatility in, the, in asset markets is high, but in fact, it's typically, these days, quite low. 
and it has been low for quite a long time, although there are pockets of time and pockets of places where it's higher. You see on here, notably, Chile and Argentina both have had political difficulties and show heavy red uh, color coding for their financial markets, but not too many other places uh, show that kind of high volatility. But if you look back in time, of course, after the Brexit vote, you see that a great deal of the world turned red. In particular, something like 20 markets in, in, UK, in uh, Europe are all red in this picture, as well as the US, Canada, Australia, South Africa, Japan, Thailand. Lots of places are red. So one of the things we see when we look at measures of volatility, and this is again from VLAB, you see that volatility is continually going up and down. And what's plotted on here is the volatility of different asset classes. Some of these are stocks, some are bonds, some are real estate. Uh, we have uh, commodities, and I think even uh, and the euro is on there, and I think even uh, exchange rates are on this, this map. So on this chart, why do volatilities move like this? Well, it's not too surprising, really. We have an explanation for this, which is generally that factors that we consider to be important in pricing assets and measuring the risk around the world are the, the reason that they all, those factors carry this information. And these factors explain why assets are correlated with each other. But it turns out that these factors of asset pricing do not explain why volatilities are correlated with each other. If you take out the factors so that we see only what's called the idiosyncrasies, that is the part of returns that are not explained by the factors, they also peak at the same time. So it really is not our, the factors that we tend to study and we build our financial models about that explain why volatilities move together. So what is it? Well, I think it's geopolitical risk, and that's where we're going tonight. So here's some facts about volatilities that we'll find useful in understanding this. Even though asset returns are nearly impossible to predict, volatilities are not too hard to predict. We can build statistical models to predict volatility. That's what I got my Nobel Prize for, and it's what I showed on that last, sl last slide. So-called Arch and Garch models are early candidates, and there are much more recent candidates for this now. But if you can predict something, then you can talk about the surprises in this prediction. If you predict something and what happens is different, then that's a surprise. We call it an innovation. And what we are going to uh, show is that the, that the shocks to volatility are really where geopolitical risk lies. These shocks to volatility of one asset class and the shocks to volatility of another asset class of a, one country and another country are all correlated with each other. So the fact that these volatility shocks are correlated means that, that this is a pervasive factor that we have not previously uh, identified, and it's a volatility factor, which uh, we're going to examine. So I'm going to call this factor GeoVol, so that we give it a name. And it stands for 
geopolitical volatility, but it stands for it in a very particular fashion. When GeoVol has a high value, it means that all asset returns are more volatile. They aren't necessarily going down, they might be going up, but they're volatile. And so GeoVol is going to be high when there is news which affects all asset classes and all countries around the world. That's the idea. Sometimes GeoVol will reflect political or military or terrorist uh, activities. Sometimes it's very impactful economic news. But altogether, we're going to think of it as geopolitical volatility. So how do we measure the shocks to volatility? Well, if you have a way of predicting volatility, which the Arch and Garch models are a way of doing this, then we can talk about how good your predictions are. And so if we look at the return on stock minus what it was predicted to be using past information and these factors of production, that's the error in predicting what the stock market was going to do, and the volatility is the square of that. We're going to divide it by the predicted level of volatility to make it a percentage error in volatility, and that is the raw material that we're going to talk about tonight. The difference between what the stock return is and what is predicted to be is a forecast error, and its square is a volatility shock. So we construct our factors of production so that there's no more correlation across assets. But this does not imply that the squares of this asset are not correlated. And this is the factor which we're going to use to define GeoVol. We can look at the correlation across assets in the square of this volatility shock and see whether, in fact, there is something, something that we hadn't previously observed, which we are going to call the GeoVol. So I said I wasn't going to have any equations tonight. I, I, I promised that I wouldn't have any equations. I know you're heartbroken about this, but, um, well, here's one. I think it's the only one, which says, let's write down an equation which tells you how this geoval shock affects a particular asset. So this is an asset that you're holding in your portfolio, and we want to know what its variance is. When we do risk management, we're always interested in variances, and so this is a question. What is the variance of the, of the asset that you've got? And it's, if X is the GeoVol, we think that this asset might have a coefficient, which is its impact. So this is a fact, well, in the language of factors, this is a factor loading, but in language of just common sense, it's the fraction of G of all that you're going to get. So if, you're, if your asset is not very exposed, your little s is going to be a small number. If your asset is highly exposed to geopolitical risk, then your little s is going to be a big number. And since we know that the variance of E is supposed to be 1, since this is a the normalization that we've already done, then we have to add 1 minus s to this. And this is our little simple equation for uh, how geopolitical volatility affects the assets that we own. It affects all of them, but it affects some more than others. OK? OK. So our interpretation is that x is like uh, a variance. And when the factor loading is high, it means that the stocks 
which have this high factor loading will have a bigger standard deviation than stock when this x is small. And when the s is small, it isn't a big difference, but when s is big, there's a big difference between times of geopolitical volatility and times without it. So this looks like another equation, but it's really the same equation. And for people who know how I've written volatility models in the past, we can think about the shock to our asset return as being written as a volatility, a standard deviation times a purely random shock. And this is the equation which we use for arch models, we use for Garch models, and but this is a different version of it which is specifically designed for this GVOL factor. Okay, how does this work? Let's take a look at a data set. And this is a country data set with uh, on ETFs which are traded in the US and the picture in blue is for the returns of the first asset in the data set which happens to be Austria. So you can see from this that sometimes returns are more volatile than others and if you're interested in what we mean by volatility, it means that the amplitude is high. And you can see the financial crisis is a time of very high amplitude or high volatility for this asset. If you build a Garch model on this asset and you plot two standard deviations of it, you get the red curve on the top and you can see that's a way of measuring the volatility at every point in time. And when I showed you the volatility map of the world, it would be the last point on this picture if this was the end of our data set. It would be telling you what the volatility is predicted to be tomorrow. So you can see it goes up when volatility is high and goes back down otherwise. And so it's a, it's a clever little statistical model which does that. The bottom curve is our shocks to returns divided by the predicted standard deviation. And when we think we have a good model for volatility, what it means is there is no more change in amplitude that's predictable. There's no more what we call volatility clustering in the green curve. And looking at that picture, you say, this was successful. And I tell my students, look at this. When there's no more volatility clustering, it means that you've done a good job estimating this model. And people all over the world stop modeling at that point. But tonight, we're going to carry it a step further. Because you can see that there are some days in which the volatility is bigger than usual, and some days when it's smaller than usual. And what we're going to recognize is that the days when it's bigger than usual for Austria, it's likely to be bigger than usual for all the other countries. And that's the new piece of information that we're going to use to define geopolitical volatility. Okay, so this is what the data looks like. You know, these are the stock returns in all these different countries. When you've estimated the, the models for each of the country, you get, this is the green picture for each of these countries. They don't look exactly the same, but what we want to know is whether they're big at the same time in different countries. So a way of doing that is to square them so that positives and negatives treat, are treated the same, and then look at the correlation structure. And if you look at them, we have something like 45 countries. So this correlation matrix has a whole lot of entries in it, and this is just a, a little part of it. And this is the correlation between 
the first 16 of these and uh, the first six over here, you see the numbers aren't very big. But there is something very special about these numbers. They're all positive. And if these were random, there, half of them would be negative. But they're all positive. And if you look at this 45 by 45 matrix, you, still, you will see that I think all of them are positive still. So this is very significant uh, evidence that there is a geopolitical volatility factor which is driving all of these countries at the same time. So I have a nice little econometric way of estimating this. It involves estimating time series models to get the, to get the factor loadings and cross-section models to get the estimate of GeoVol and then doing it over and over again until it converges. Probably you don't want me to do that, right? Okay, let me just show you the results. This is in the middle here. There we go. In the middle here is the data on the GeoVol. And it's sorted so that the largest day is first. And then there are something like 5,000 days in the data set. So the smallest one is way under the platform here. So let's just look at the, at the top of this list. The date of the largest GeoVol event is 2001, September uh, 17th. So what is that date? Well, that date is one week after the 9-11 uh, terrorist bomb uh, crashing the airplanes into the World Trade Towers in, in New York. And the markets were closed for a week. And so this is the day they reopened. And this is the, the biggest geovolatility shock in our data set by this measure. The second one is 2016, uh, June 24th. That's Brexit. This is the day after the Brexit election vote. The third one is 2007, February 27th. So this is the first early warning of the financial crisis, and it's also a day when the Chinese stock market had a big, big drop. Chinese stock market had a big drop, and UBS had some hedge funds that were invested in mortgage securities, which got into trouble. So this actually was a harbinger for the financial crisis and moved markets dramatically. I don't think we have a good identification of the April 21st, but in 1997, uh, October 27th, there was a stock market crash which caused the exchange in New York to be uh, closed early. Then we, see, we have down here the, the Trump election in 2016, 11.09, that's November 9th. Going down a little further, we get commodity uh, collapse in Chinese stock. They call it Black Monday. This is when the, the bubble in the Chinese stock market actually collapsed. And uh, 2008, September 29th is the day on which the House rejected the TARP bill. And down here, 2008, October 13th is the day they passed the TARP bill. In any case, you can go down this list and may, you may be able to identify some events that I haven't done yet, but it's a pretty reasonable list of things that have happened over the last two decades, two, two and a half decades really, and which ones really moved all the markets of the world. 
That means that they are geopolitical events. On the far right-hand side is what the average of all these markets did on that day. And so you see many of those are negative. So that when, when there's a geopolitical event, typically the returns are negative. However, for some of these events, the returns are positive. They move the markets a lot, but it could be up or it could be down. Okay. Now, corresponding to these uh, events are factor loadings. So these are what tell you which, as, which countries are most impacted by these geopolitical events. So you multiply the geopolitical factor by S for each country, tells you how much of it you're, you're getting. And the highest ones are France, Netherlands, Germany, Spain, Belgium. So those are all European countries, and they were impacted together. But then you also see Thailand, Malaysia, Korea. United States is down a little, a little bit further. And you go down this list. Um, China is in the, the second, top of the second column. And as you keep going down, you find you come to the ones at the bottom, which are less impacted by geopolitical risk. And there's Pakistan, New Zealand. And the third one up is India. So it's the countries that are in the bottom of this list may have a lot of volatility, but it's not so coordinated with the rest of the world. So they're less sensitive to geopolitical risk. And I think a lot of that makes sense. And so the, I think it's interesting to see what these are. This is really our first estimate of these f factors, but it may be that this is leading us to a way of taking our portfolios and tilting them a little bit toward assets which are less correlated with the geopolitical events of our times. So what are, what, are the, what are some other approaches to measuring geopolitical risk? And do they give the same answer as this? Well, first of all, let's take a look at these numbers and look at these as a, um, on a monthly average. And what you see are some of these uh, events. Here you see the 9-11 as the, as the biggest on the screen, but also layman's collapse is high, uh, Chinese bubble, Dow Jones, debt crisis, Brexit, Trump. But interestingly, when you get all the way to the present, it doesn't look that high. We tend to think that we are in an age when geopolitical risk is really elevated. But the markets don't seem to know about that. The markets think this is not a time that's especially dangerous. And that's the green that we showed on the volatility plot map. It's the markets are not so worried about these geopolitical events as we tend to be. Here are two more measures of geopolitical risk, one of which is the geopolitical uh, estimate uh, of political uncertainty. And that's in blue. This is by um, three professors, uh, uh, Baker, Bloom, and Davis. And what you see is it was somewhat elevated during 2001 when the World Trade Towers were hit. It was somewhat elevated during the financial crisis, but it's actually higher 
since 2016, and maybe the highest point on the entire graph is in, uh, 2000, is in 2019. That's this year. So this is a, a measure which is based on newspapers, reading the newspapers and seeing how much political uncertainty is there when you read the newspaper. And there's a lot of political uncertainty when you, when, when writers write about the geopolitical risk, they're very concerned about the uh, events of our times. And it shows in the newspapers and it's on the screen. A second one is by two researchers at the New York, at the, the Federal Reserve Bank in Washington. And that's a little bit more focused on stress between countries, but particularly military and terrorist stress. And you see it has an enormous spike around 9-11 and uh, also subsequently the Iraq war that um, relatively disastrously we uh, did. So it shows a little bit of a rise at the end, but it's certainly not the highest it ever was, and, uh, but it is elevated. Here's a third one, and this is, comes from BlackRock, which uh, has a careful analysis of geopolitical risk based on experts. They ask expert opinion, what are the 10 things that you're most worried about? And let's figure out how they are going to impact financial markets and how likely they are to happen and how big is the effect going to be. And so as they do that, they come up with this picture of rising and falling geopolitical risk. And this also thinks that today is particularly high in geopolitical risk. I must say, if, if your broker tells you to worry about this, then you might buy some stock or sell some. And I think if this chart didn't show anything, BlackRock wouldn't be doing it. So I think that, the, I think that there is a re reason to uh, be interested in the most recent part, because that's where the clients are, are trading. So I think, again, there is evidence that BlackRock's experts think that geopolitical risk is high. But altogether, these four measures don't tell the same story. They're not the same measures. They're measuring different things. But if you're interested in how vulnerable the markets are, it's not a time when the, when the geopolitical risk seems to be high. So what are the implications of this for financial stability? Do we have a heavy weight over, over us? Uh, Supposed to be funny. Uh, it's, it's okay. <laughs> so this is a uh, a nice uh, sculpture park outside of New York City, and it seems like a reasonable thing to look at when we're asking whether there is an implication for financial stability of this geopolitical risk. So I'm going to show you some data on S risk, which is what we call systemic risk. And what it is is a way of measuring whether the financial sector is under stress, whether the financial sector is undercapitalized. We calculate this measure once a week for more than 1,000 financial firms around the world. We can do it with publicly available information. It uses some of the statistical methods from the uh, Nobel Prize to talk about time varying volatilities and correlations, but basically it's a pretty simple measure. What's it supposed to measure? It's supposed to measure the number of dollars a financial firm would need 
in order to continue to function normally if there is a global stock market decline of 40% over the next six months. Okay? So there's the stock market goes down, financial firms, stock goes down with it. Does it go down so far that they need to raise capital in order to continue to do their business? That's the question. And if they have to raise capital, how much do they have to raise? How does it work? It looks at the ratio of the market cap to the accounting liabilities. It looks not just at what that ratio looks like today, it looks like what that ratio would look like if the global stock market fell by 40%. Okay? And then it says, okay, how much capital would you need to bring it back up to a normal level, which we interpret as 8%. For many financial institutions, that's more or less where they operate. So S risk, as a consequence, is high when the market value of assets is low. That is when they're, the loans that they've written are, are low in value or the, the companies that they own go down in value. And it's especially high when the firm is highly levered and big. So why is this important? Well, in Western economies, when a firm has high S risk, it means that it's vulnerable if there's going to be a financial crisis. It's at risk. You don't, no one wants to raise capital in the middle of a downturn. So the risk manager and the regulator are going to come to these companies and say, you shouldn't have so much leverage. You should reduce your S risk. You should reduce your leverage, reduce, improve, strengthen your balance sheet. Commonly, this is done by selling assets and using the proceeds to retire debt. So if one firm does this, it's likely to be pretty successful in strengthening its balance sheet. But if it's one of many firms in a country that are trying to strengthen their balance sheet at the same time, then there are no buyers for these assets. And that's exactly when the price is going to fall a lot. Unless international buyers will buy these, these assets, these loans, these bonds. But if the rest of the world is also undercapitalized at this point, then they're not going to buy them either. So they're going to fall dramatically in value. As they fall in value, the stock prices will fall even further for these financial firms. They will, their S risk will get even higher. And we have what we call a fire sale spiral, where the values spiral down because everyone's trying to sell these assets. You could think about the the mortgage-backed securities that, that banks tried to sell during the financial crisis, the values fell so far that they decided they often that they wouldn't sell them, but they couldn't really restructure their balance sheets. It shows how hard it is to do this when you try to do it all at the same time. So the risk of one country depends on its financial institutions and how high their S risk is, but it also depends on the rest of the world. And this is one of the reasons why cooperation and coordination of monetary and, and, and financial policy across central banks is tremendously important. Um, I should say that this is described in more detail in a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science that I wrote with my uh, co-author uh, Tianyu Ruan, who is a professor at uh, National University of Singapore. Why is this important in China, or why is it important in India? Well, in economies such as China and India, where many of the financial institutions are state-owned, the pressure for an undercapitalized institution to delever is reduced because there is, since they're state owned, there is no possibility that a Chinese bank is going to fail. 
And I don't know, but I don't think there's a strong possibility that an Indian publicly owned, uh, government-owned bank is likely to fail. There will be capital forthcoming to, uh, to bail them out. They won't have to rely on the private sector to try to do this. Nevertheless, if such a bank is undercapitalized, they are not going to want to make new loans. If they make new loans and then it turns out that they are, they need to go and beg for money to the government, they are going to feel like they're going to be criticized as bad managers who don't know what they're doing and perhaps lose their job. So, and on top of this, state-owned banks often have legacy loans that are underperforming. They may be non-performing or just underperforming, and there will be pressure on them to uh, extend, re-extend loans to, uh, to these companies, and uh, that puts further pressure on the balance sheet of the banks. So, as a consequence, if the state-owned or, or private borrowers weaken, the banks tend to weaken even in state-owned systems. And so the same kind of dynamic may be true there. What to do? Well, rather than extending new loans to legacy borrowers, we state-owned banks can contemplate letting the loans default. And letting the loans default has not been uh, very common in China. China tends to think that that leads to social unrest, and so they have stopped doing, they stopped a lot of defaults from happening. In India, there is a new bankruptcy law, which will, uh, some of you know a lot about. Um, so in any case, if we think that bankruptcy laws are like a hospital for distressed companies, then really it might make sense to fail to roll over existing loans and make new loans to more profitable companies and let the old loans default. There is some collateral that you can recover and it may be actually that has more value uh, as a strategy than rolling over the old loans. So, from a social point of view, of course, this also makes sense because you'd like to reduce your exposure to industries which are growing slowly or declining and increase your exposure to the growth industries. You don't want to, you don't want to maintain zombie banks, zo sorry, zombie firms as your creditors if you're a bank. So let's take a look at the data. Data comes in all different shapes and colors, um, and let's see what we see. So here is the picture that worries me. This is the sum of all the S-risk of all the countries in the world. So this is what we calculate every week, and if you add up all the dollars, it looks like in the financial crisis, it would have taken a little bit less than $4 trillion to recapitalize all the banks in the world. In this European sovereign debt crisis, it would have taken just a little bit more, a hair more, maybe, maybe $4 trillion to recapitalize them all. The third peak doesn't have a name, but I think it's got something to do with China. But the last one is the one we want to talk about, where it's actually inched above the same, the level of everything we've seen since 2000. So today we have the sum of S risk that's higher than it's ever been by our measurement. So we have to understand a little better where it is, what the causes are, is it likely to lead us to a financial crisis? 
Here is a picture of what you see when you look at the Americas. This is North and South America, and at least by this low point, which is January of 2018, it's clear that the level of S risk has come down, and at the if we stopped time at exactly the right moment, we'd say, in fact, we've gotten back to uh, pre-crisis levels. But it's now rising at the end. And I think that could be interpreted as a consequence of this trade war. If we look at Europe, you see something similar, although it has not declined as much, but it's also not rising as fast. If you look at China, I mean at uh, Asia, you see a very different story. We see debt rising. The uh, undercapitalization of the financial sector is increasing in a pretty inexorable way over this whole sample period, particularly since the financial crisis. If you look at China by itself, you see it's even steeper. So this is obviously where some of this high S risk is coming from. If you look at Hong Kong, you see the, the very sharp rise just at the end. But I mean, that's probably due to the protests in Hong Kong, which have, I think, decimated the financial markets to some extent. And you want to see the next one or not? <laughs> what is the next one going to be? <laughs> it's India. You're right. So what do you see when you look at India? Well, it doesn't have this rise at the end. It has been sort of the same level for maybe eight or nine years. And it's jiggling around, but it's not really getting worse. And it's not getting better. It's just sort of level. Um, so the question that you're asking yourselves is, is this, is this a problem? So we want to get to that. So if we summarize all these pictures that I just showed you, here's China, the highest. Second highest, Japan, I didn't show you that. Then we have the United States, UK, France, Canada, Korea, and so forth. And then here's India, well, right in the middle. You can see it there. And so it's by no means uh, the biggest of all, uh, at all. It's really sort of in the middle. And there are, of course, many countries down below this that are, have no S risk at all. This is just, these are, this, these are the, the largest. If you think that this fire sale is the concern, then you should use the same scaling. Some of these countries are bigger than others. And that makes a difference to how much S risk you would expect and how much S risk you can tolerate. A good way of scaling is the total assets in the financial sector. And that's the way Tianyu and I scaled them in the National Academy paper. And this is now the same picture, but scaled by total assets. And now you see, first of all, China is no longer on top. It's moved down a few spaces. India is still sort of in the middle. But Japan is on top. And then we have Korea and actually Jersey and Denmark and sort of smaller countries there, they probably don't have, have the impact, but they might have the risk. And if you look more closely at India, I'm sorry, if, if I offend anybody here, <laughs> um, anyway, the, the bulk of the S risk for India is the State Bank of India. How many of you bank there? No? OK. <laughs> so do you have risk? Well, probably not, because it's, it's a state-owned enterprise. We don't think it actually has risk. But it may be contributing to the risk 
of India and ultimately to the financial system as a whole. Well, bankruptcy reform is kind of what we think might be the solution for this. It's in, in, uh, in China, there is a new push to have lots of new bankruptcy courts that are using a more uh, US style bankruptcy uh, program and that is um, probably a good thing. There are, there are now some bankruptcies in China. There are mostly they're in the private sector, but there have been some defaults in the public sector, in the state-owned enterprises. And my feeling is that by providing a, a much more extensive set of court systems and a more liberal bankruptcy law, it's going to be possible for China to reduce the debt load on its banks. India is doing the same thing. So in a sense, there is a lot of similarity between these two countries, even though there are, of course, many differences. The uh, bankruptcy reforms were passed in 2016, which actually forced lenders to send borrowers to bankruptcy for any missed payment. So the idea that there could be long-term non-performing loans on your balance sheet uh, is, isn't challenged by this law. It doesn't mean that you can't extend new credit to someone so that they can actually pay back the old one. So that still is an option that banks must decide whether they're going to do or not. However, this has been a blow was, was struck to this by the courts who blocked restructuring of SR Steel um, and putting this whole program in limbo. But I gather in just about a week ago, the uh, Supreme Court rejected the lower court ruling and has now allowing the new bankruptcy procedures to continue in a timely fashion. So I think that, that the prospects for the bankruptcy reform and removing the non-performing loans from the Indian banks are actually look pretty promising as well. Um, excessive red tape and interminable judicial schedules make it difficult for everyone to plan what to do about non-performing loans. It makes it difficult for the banks to decide whether to extend new credits. It makes it difficult for firms to decide how much risk to take. It makes it difficult for the banks to decide whether to send, uh, extend a first loan to, to a risky company. So transparency in this judicial system will be extremely valuable and competence is going to be extremely important. So much remains to be done to reduce the backlog, but I think the direction is quite promising. Um, you can see here the increase in uh, ongoing bankruptcy cases in India and the, also the increase in closed and you know, resolved uh, bankruptcy uh, filings in India. So this doesn't go up to the present, but I think it probably, uh, my guess is it continues to look like this. So in closing, the question is, are we prepared? And I leave you with that question. So thank you. So people, when they invest and the calls go right, 